Welcome to Optily Radio, your regular 30-minute dose of everything you need to accelerate your e-commerce marketing success. Welcome back to Optily Radio. I'm your host, Nina White, and I'm really excited today for two reasons. One, because we're talking about something very different from what we've covered previously on the show, which is the super important topic of data visualization for e-commerce marketing. But secondly, this is our 10th episode, and it's so wild to see how far we've come with this show in just a few short months. It's really an amazing milestone since the vast majority of shows don't make it past episode 9. So a big shout out to everyone at Optily who has helped with all of our interviews so far, and especially to our amazing editor, Claire Murphy, for putting together all the videos, audio cuts, and social promos. Thank you. Back to the topic at hand, data visualization. It's not only necessary for marketers to be able to access the huge amount of data we get from our CRM software, analytics tools, and ad accounts, but also to piece it all together and make sense of it. Spreadsheets simply don't cut it most of the time, especially when we're presenting to stakeholders. Visualization helps paint a picture and truly tell the story of what's working and what isn't with the various data points that we rely on as marketers. This also highlights the importance of bridging that gap between data scientists, data analysts, and marketers, which we'll also get into today. And just a note for people tuning in on the audio-only version of the podcast, since we are talking about visualization, our guest does have some examples to share. So if you aren't driving and you can tune into our video cast on YouTube, you'll definitely get more out of it. So without further delay, let's jump into episode 10. Today in the virtual studio, we've got Michelle Kier joining us. Michelle is the Senior Product Manager of Reporting, Analytics, and Data Science at SalesLoft. He's a creative product leader with over 10 years of experience in information, product management, and data products. He also currently teaches at Georgia State University as an adjunct professor of data visualization and at the General Assembly Atlanta in data analytics. And from the Optily side of things, we have our in-house director of data and analytics, TJ Sizemore. TJ heads up the creation of our data-driven predictive models for ad spend optimization. He has over a decade of experience in data analytics with extensive experience in some of the big names in e-commerce, including Coca-Cola, Home Depot, and Kohl's. He's completed both an MBA and a master's in analytics from Georgia State University, where he took a Tableau workshop led by Michelle. So welcome to the show, Michelle and TJ. Thank you, Nina. Good to be here. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for having us. Great. So I hear uh, things over on the East Coast are really heating up these days. Temperature is well over 100. How are you guys keeping cold? We're okay. I was on vacation last week in upstate New York, and in the evenings it was in 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So, oh, nice. So, <laughs> so go was, to New York. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now I'm in, back in at home in Atlanta, and uh, it's not. It's reasonable right now. It's still raining this week, but I suspect as we get into July and August, as TJ and I know, it'll it'll get warm here. Yeah. <laughs> so just stay inside. Go in the basement. <laughs> stay cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, Dublin is. You know, mid 60s, like usual, no rain today. So, are enjoying some nice sunshine here. <laughs> so, Michelle, why don't you um, tell us a little bit about yourself? How you, how it is you got started with marketing and sales data visualization, and what brought you to SalesLoft? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about that um, early with, with your question. And I, I, you know, I, my first job in my career about 30 years ago was with Estee Lauder. Um, and I was with them for a few years and I went back to school and then I joined Coca-Cola and I was there for about six or seven years. So I think between, even though I was on the operations side, um, both at Estee Lauder and Coca-Cola, you, you kind of were exposed to marketing and sales almost through osmosis, you know, part of the business. I was in both analyst roles in both of those 
So I think that's how I got started. So it's almost been 30 years now, just kind of, I, I, my kids tease me because I started using Excel in 1988. Um, so it's been a long time. <laughs> and then, and then um, a few years, I had been on, on my own um, consulting for a few years. And then sales off had an opportunity for me to kind of um, help lead kind of what they were doing on analytics and, and kind of pitch in a little bit on the, on the data science from, from a feature standpoint. And it was kind of a really good opportunity. I, I really love opportunities to think about presenting data to non-analytical people. So healthcare workers, educators, salespeople, marketing people, I think that's kind of my, my niche in the world that I've defined for myself. Awesome. That sounds really exciting. Yeah, that's it's quite a few years using Excel. Has it gotten better over the years? <laughs> Oh, you, you still don't know everything. There's still, you're <laughs> always learning something else. It is still enigmatic. Awesome. So it uh, brings me to our second question. What is your favorite and least favorite type of visualization? Well, I, I think, you know, it's funny. Uh, um, visualizations end up being like vegetables for me. I have a preference for one where I obsess over it and then I kind of move on. Yeah. <laughs> I know there was a time when I was really obsessive about uh, tree maps and I saw all data, particularly in sales data, there's a lot of hierarchical data where it's layered and a tree map can be really good for that. I think right now I'm, I'm really obsessive on displaying uh, trends. You know, what are all, if you think about all the ways we've dealt with COVID and about, it's all a bit about the trend data. So I've been really obsessive about kind of like, what's the right way to get a simple line graph and to kind of be, have to be informed and just, looking in all the different ways that folks are reporting on different data as trends. So that's probably what my, my preference is now to, to look at trend data, to kind of ex explore and expand on that. Um, least favorite, I think, are those charts or visualizations that just don't have any labels. Um, I liked, I don't know if you remember this, TJ, but I, I often will say um, a visualization with no labeling is effectively like a gift with no card, right? you get it and you're not sure what to do with it, who it came from and it, very much that same kind of way. And I think that it's less about the chart. I think it's more about kind of how it gets presented to me or how it gets delivered much like you would package up a gift. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, the trend part of it, you're right. It's how do you take a complicated, um, you know, data structure and put it in a very simplistic, easy to read that you can, find insights. I think when people see a, a trend line and they see an insight and they're like, oh, look at this, what happened here? That's that's like a, yeah, it's a wonderful feeling from an analyst standpoint. Like you can give them that opportunity to see something that they wouldn't be able to see in a table. I think that's, um, it's a really nice visualization. And, and I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've come across. Um, I think my, my least favorite of non-labels is a, is a pie chart like you have a pie chart with 10 slices and it tells you, you know, it has the colors, but no labels. And you're like, what am I looking at? That is so frustrating. So a hundred percent. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. That makes sense. So yeah. speaking of. If you if, related to that, I'm sorry, Nita. But go ahead, like, go ahead. Related to that, TJ, a lot of the trending discussion now is about scaling. Right. About like, mm. how do you represent things logarithmically? You know, what's the right scaling to convey yeah. that? I mean, it's less about the line, right? And how pretty you make the line or how size yeah. it, but it's just like, what's the right scaling and the right axes to kind of get it right? And I think there's been a lot of great discussion in the past year about that. That's been really intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So when we talk about data visualization, there are plenty of tools out there to choose from. You know, some are free, some are definitely not free. Um, so we've got Data Studio, Tableau, Looker, Power BI, Excel. Um, those are the big ones. So regardless of what you're using, what are some of the most essential elements that can help you tell a story with data? Um, and, and I can share a slide um, or yeah, a visual to this, but give you some idea. I think the biggest piece where folks get uh, mixed around when it comes to tooling is what you do to explore data yourself, the, to, to explore and understand the data is very different from what you present to someone else. 
So I might very often use a scatter plot or something where I can consume a lot of the data for myself and, you know, put a million data points on a scatter plot and see what it says. But I would never share that with someone else. And I think where folks get wrong on visualizations is they think that what they, works for them for understanding is going to work for their audience. And to really start to delineate very intentionally between exploration, which visualization is really helpful for, versus presentation, which is I need you to kind of understand something and potentially take action on it. So if I, I'll share my screen briefly and I'll describe it for the uh, audience. I have a metaphor here. Um, so what I like to think about it is this sc uh, screen here. What I have on one side as the left hand is a series of ingredients for a recipe. So it's a food items, it's a little pasta, it's some squash, it's an apple, it's some hazelnuts and some basil and a little bit of butter. Um, typically we as analysts like TJ and I, we want to consume a lot of the details and we want the raw ingredients to be able to kind of understand something. However, what is on the right hand side of the screen is a, the finished meal with those same ingredients. What our decision makers really want and the people we're presenting to is the finished product. So I think to your point, Nina, about the tools, it's less about the tools and it's more about like, who's the audience and what, what am I trying to give them? Am I trying to give them something to explore with or am I trying to give them something um, that's a final presentation? In most cases in sales and marketing, as analysts, we're presenting, it's a presentation and we're trying to educate uh, someone or to get them to take action. And I think that's where um, things, things get a little bit turned around. And, and even like when you have your ingredients and you present the dish to your consumer who's going to actually consume that, um, do you find that the feedback process, even after that, don't assume that what you're presenting to them is 100% what they're expecting. Um, so even taking that further, do you feel like the feedback process, keeping that open, communicating like what they're seeing, what they're and in your example, what they're tasting, what they're experiencing, is that aligned to what their expectation is? Yeah, I think you, you raise a great point, TJ. Um, the other part of being successful in the visualization is knowing the context. So one is, is the audience, uh, what is their level of analytical capability? Um, but probably even more important that is when you and I are in the room, TJ, and we're presenting something, we, can resp we're, we are the interactive filter on the, mm -hmm. on, the, on the slides and the charts, right? They ask a question, we adapt, we ch change slides, we can do all those things. Uh, oftentimes we think about slides as something that we can also give to someone without context. So I often think that if I'm presenting something with Tableau and I'm not gonna be in the room, I really have to make it interactive. I have to provide a lot of filtering, I have to provide a lot of labeling so that they can kind of explore and, and, and come to, it's almost like self-service, right? If I'm in the room, I can answer the questions and be there for them. If, if I'm not in the room, I need to make it in a very self-service way that they can find the answers themselves. Yeah. yeah. So the, if, the visualization if, becomes the analyst almost to some degree. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's almost like, I guess the, the best metaphor is really like you, you either have the, the person tour guide when you're presenting, you're in the room, or it's, it's the audio one where you're actually walking around the museum with the guide in you, or it's telling you like, go to station seven. Okay, now here's, I'm gonna tell you what to do. So you have to learn how to sort of speak the language that, you know, the business leaders and the marketers will understand. Otherwise, if you just give them, you know, the graphs on their own, they might not necessarily know what they're looking for. Um, so you do have to kind of cultivate it and curate it so that you bridge that divide between data science and business. Yeah. You know, in, in, our, in our world, on, um, with our customers in Salesloft, right, we have very, t and even in our internal sales teams, we have tactical weekly reports and weekly updates, just like most businesses, right? It's, it's an email, it's a spreadsheet, it kind of gives you like, here's this week compared to next week. But then we also have quarterly business reviews, which is a presentation where you're actually having a discussion about uh, a post-mortem on the previous quarter, which is much more of a conversation. And I think that we, when we think about visualization, we should think about our delivery mechanism in the same way. 
right? Again, I, I go back to the gift analogy or the tour analogy often is if I'm bringing a gift to Nina in Dublin, I, I want it to be something I can, I can actually carry, <laughs> you know? And if I want to give it to her, I want to give it to her wrapped up versus maybe if I'm just shipping it to her. And I think a lot of times when we're thinking about executives, we, we don't think about it in the context of what their skills are, what their time availability is, as well as kind of like, you know, how it will be presented. I'm always, um, if you look at Gar Reynolds, he's a big presentation. He wrote the book Presentation Zen. Um, he really gives a format about like this idea about for a meeting, you're going to kind of do a one page uh, email, kind of like a little email summary about, you know, what you're going to talk about. Then the meeting, you actually have slides. And then after the meeting, you basically have a write up which summarizes what you talked about. And so in a lot of ways, the presentation is actually three pieces and not one. I think where we get um, mixed up is when we deliver, like we send the slides ahead of time, we give the slides and then we leave the slides afterwards. And like, you know, the CFO wants to share it to the CEO. Well, he's not going to forward the slides because it's not helpful because the CEO wasn't in the room. They don't, he doesn't have all the context. But if you had the CEO had the one page write up that came afterwards, that's something that's now shareable. Yeah, it's like um, you can wrap a Easter present in Christmas wrapping, but it's going to be confusing. Yes, <laughs> um, and then afterwards, analogy. yeah, it, yeah, it's um, and you know you want to make sure that after you open the present, you write your thank you note. So, I mean, they're all uh, they're they're all pieces to the process that are very important to communication. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly right. So TJ, you had mentioned that um, sometimes you hear marketers ask for the table. Where's the table? I want to see the table. Show me the table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so why is it that it's important for marketers as well to retrain their brains in order to be able to use visualization to pull insights out of the data? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great, um, like, Great question that I've been not struggling to answer, but um, you know, struggling to, to communicate. So, you know, Michelle, I love your your insight to how do you handle that when you know you have someone that's you know working in an Excel table and that's what they're comfortable with. They know where to go, they know where to look, they've trained themselves. Like, if I look at this column, you know, this sum row, I get exactly what I'm looking for. Why do I need to look at the visualizations that you're creating? Why do I need to kind of retrain my brain for that? And I struggle sometimes with giving an answer or response to that. And so I'm curious, like how you handle that um, conversation uh, with a potential you know, client or consumer of your data. Yeah. So we see, we see the same thing on the sales side, right? Is most salespeople who are consuming information are on Salesforce or um, on Dynamics where everything is a table or their most familiar Salesforce report is effectively a table. So that mm. it's, it's almost, um, their, it becomes their preference just because that's what they're conditioned to. Um, I also wonder sometimes, TJ, if that, there's a trust element. They need to actually see the values in the cells themselves to trust the data. Mm. G generally, what I've seen in, in those specific cases or try to do in those cases is introduce not just cold turkey, take away the table, but to put some kind of summary chart above the table where the, the, the chart is effectively summarizing what the table has below. And in fact, sometimes the chart is actually a filter, right? You can click on the bar and now I see the details below it. So you're not really taking the table away. You're basically treating the table as a to-do list, right? Um, where mm -hmm. they're not kind of consuming lots and lots of details or trying to summary. And then you'll notice as, as you start to talk about the visual of those consumers, um, they'll start to kind of ask questions about the chart or want an additional filter. And you'll notice their dependency on the table. I think ultimately the way we use tables ultimately comes down to trust. They, mm -hmm. Users who, particularly those who are not as data savvy or data familiar, want to know that you're not afraid to, um, wants to know that you're not afraid to show them the details. Uh, we did something a few years ago in a, at Juice and like we had a button so that people could see the details and 80% uh, of the time they never clicked on to see the table. They just used the charts, but they, they wanted the comfort to know that we weren't afraid to give them the details. 
Okay. Do you, and do you think it's important for, you know, in, in, in my case, marketers to, to, you know, what's the value that they're going to get viewing a, a, a graph or a chart versus a table? Do you think that they'll get more insight or, um, do you think it'll be faster for them? Like, I guess what's the takeaway for them? Yeah, they're going to be able to pick, they're going to be pick out a trend or summary much quicker, just cognitively than they will with the table. Right. The, the risk is that, that they could miss something by when you're using a table, you're biased in terms of how you're looking at it because you look at it the same way. There's a, the chart offers an opportunity to kind of change their brain a little bit, change their cognitive perspective, either through summary or through a trend or through, like uh, oftentimes, if you, I'll use your pie chart example from earlier. Like if I did a, a stacked rank, they may say like, wait, I would have never thought this was my third most popular category. They assumed it was like seventh or eighth, but they would never see that in a table, but they would see it in a chart. So the moment the chart kind of challenges some, or some, challenges some of their assumptions, that can be a really good thing. Okay. So, and, and Nina, I'm going to jump into the next question. Sorry, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the subset of this question is because you've kind of touched on it a little bit um, is, you know, from a data analyst standpoint, what, you know, you know, we should be looking out for making the table more interactive. So not necessarily trying to show them new things, but show them what they're currently working in in a different way. Um, by making that table interactive, giving them a different perspective on the data they're already comfortable with, that will help open up that conversation and build that trust, which I think is a great point between the analyst and the the consumer, the marketer, whoever the person is that's consuming the data. Um, and I, I, is there any other, um, you know, uh, recommendations for the analyst as they're working with, uh, you know, someone that's used to a table? that they should, um, you know, prepare themselves for, or, you know, what do you wish someone would have told you type of thing as you were going through this process? Yeah, I think um, taking the time to know, to know the audience a little bit more and, and being intentional not to make assumptions about what the skills are or what they should know. I, I think that's the, probably the most, even folks on my team now would just be like, don't make assumptions about, what they should know because they probably don't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they should know this. They've been doing this. They may, they may not. And that's okay, yeah. but don't assume it. I, I think that's the, the best piece of advice. Typically when I think about audience, I think about three things is one is like, what's the medium I'm communicating? Is it a presentation? Is it a, you know, is it on a TV screen? Is it in a, in a room? Is it in front of 300 people? It's the, the level of skill that uh, they have analytically with the data or uh, familiarity with the data. And the lastly is um, what's their ability to influence, right? If you're, te if, if, if I'm giving you a, a t um, I oftentimes think about a table as the last set of details, which becomes the to-do list. Like I said, if the to-do list for another analyst is to go modify a campaign or to modify um some tracking information. That's one thing versus like, oh my, you're, you know, if your target market's off, you know, it, it's a very different perspective when you're talking to the CEO versus yeah. an analyst. Knowing what actions they can take or what influence they have. Um, I, an analyst mistake that I see fairly often is that they're presenting data to, to someone who can't influence the decision that they, they, they want. Yeah. Right. They're only an influencer, they're not the decision maker. Or right, yeah. So, uh, M Michelle, the, the, what you're saying is it's important for the data analyst to know who they're talking to, know their audience, know what they're capable of doing, um, you know, what they can actually do with that information, because uh, that's going to help build the trust between the analyst and you know the the pre who they're presenting to their audience, and that's going to help build that that trust to a point where they can they can develop new visualizations and you know uh, start to deliver new insights in different uh, different ways to that person um, that they've probably never been comfortable before yeah I, I agree I think that you know investing a little bit of time understanding the audience about like who they are what their skill level is what kinds of decisions they're able to make um, I think is important. I think the other thing that I think a lot about is, is the trade-off on visualizations between 
familiarity and productivity, right? Like what is the most productive or effective visual? And then what's the one that's most familiar? And sometimes, you know, you have to pick the one that's familiar to the audience because it's just going to resonate. And to the, the point about trust, if you have an ongoing relationship where they trust you, you can start to kind of build kind of like sophistication. You can do more capability, but you know, oftentimes, you know, the simple kind of familiar uh, chart, um, Amanda Cox, who is the, um, you know, one of the top visualization people at the New York Times, she's actually one of the editors um, for a lot of their interactive uh, presentations. She'll say like, you know, um, one of her quotes is, I'm going to try and get it right, is, you know, there's always a reason to use a bar chart, but but life shouldn't have to be so boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that. Uh, that's good. That's good. Great. So do you have any um, examples of before and after cases where, you know, major marketing or sales decisions were made as a result of a new way of analyzing data? Uh, Let me see if it's in a different tab. Let me see if I can share my screen. Yeah, that'd Um, be great. And an approach. I think if I choose entire screen. Share. Let me see if I can kind of just... Because this is what the analysts live for, is presenting something that right. like really encourages or gets yeah, people... Like, game-changing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whoa, that's so cool. Well, I, don't, I don't know how game-changing this is, but this seems, <laughs> this seems to, to resonate for, for a, a client a, a few years ago. Um, where we actually thought about... Um, so these are kind of three metrics, but as you started to scroll down this page... Um, we allowed for them to kind of add metrics. Um, so metrics, conversion rate, sales, trial downloads. So what, what happened is that we thought of trying to think about each metric as a, as a sentence. Like, you know, what is it? How is it going? What's the trend? How does it break down? So we almost like the, answering the questions of like who, what, when, where, and why, you know, as a horizontal bar going across. And that as you wanted to see new metrics, you went to scroll down. So as you can see here, the, the charts are pretty, and this is actually done in uh, data, uh, data Studio. But you can see that all we did is kind of allow for them to kind of, you know, read all the details kind of left to right. And then to be able to, if they wanted more details on the metrics, to be able to scroll down. So this is kind of one kind of uh, approach. I, I would find... Um, the other, this is something we did in healthcare, not quite um, digital marketing, but this idea about setting, uh, this is a case that we talked about earlier where we had to set the context. We weren't in the room. So we explained what the report was in detail. We explained kind of what kind of results would be. We gave them the filtering at the top to be able to set the context. And then once, once they had read all that and done that, they could kind of actually see results. And then where things were read, as we, they had decreases uh, from what they were unexpected in terms of some patient metrics. So these are mm. kind of ex- examples where like, it's again, the charting is is pretty simple, but how we present it is where we kind of uh, put the emphasis. Yeah, this is a great example of color too, use of color. Um, I know like tables are limited um, unless you add a heat map to it, you can kind of pull some insights from there, but uh, that's one of the nice benefits of a chart is using color to really call out something that's, you know, that's alarming that they should pay attention to. So exactly, exactly right. Let's see if there's another example that I, that I put aside. The other example that I, that I had that I thought was relevant, this is a little bit dated, but this idea about like the color, uh, the, the color R orange is the same data about the same cohort. So you have, the cohort in orange here, you have them here. So as I click on orange, the other colors faded away and the orange became dominant, but I could still see kind of the other cohorts kind of, you know, faded, but I, I did that. And then it persisted throughout kind of the, this dashboard where like that color meant something to the to user. It meant it was for a particular um, cohort. Mm-hmm. So you do need like a little bit of design theory as well when you're crafting these uh, dashboards and things. Yeah, it, it, information design is kind of technically the, the practice. 
as it, as it's played out. But it's really using a lot of good design. It's using some cognitive kind of information. Um, but I think that for most people, just it's just trial and error. When you think about who the audience is, you you're not afraid to put something in front of them and then get feedback um, about what could, could or couldn't be done. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to, um, especially as an analyst, not to take things personally that you've you know put a lot of time into. Um, I mean, I'm, that's any design work, right? You're just you're putting it out there, and uh, people are going to be honest with their response, and it's hard not to take things personally. Yeah, it's it's um, if there's if there's e- <laughs> if there's ego and data analysis, it, it's it's going to cause more problems than anything else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's all. Yeah. I think that's also a nice uh, reminder to the analysts, like, uh, like to keep that communication open. Don't take things personally at the end. You're, you're trying to make sure that you're creating a, a, you know, a tool that the person can use and pull insights from. Um, and if you can get to that point, then you're going to get a much more reward than if they accept your scatter plot as, you know, one thing we've kind of danced around uh, at TJ is is also thinking for the analysts to think about what what the outcome they're driving to. If they're trying to influence a specific decision, then their design decisions and their analytical decisions should be nudging that direction. And I think folks think about storytelling and charting as as this potential for like um, something unethical. But it's, mm. but it's not this question about you're trying to influence. It's trying to convey information in a way that they're willing to process it and understand it. So storytelling is often kind of thought about like, well, if you're telling a story, it's make believe you're trying to, you know, you're trying to sell me something, right? But no, it's really about kind of, I'm giving you information in a way that I think is going to best educate you to make the right decision. Do you find um, there's like a theme or a, uh, you know, whenever you work with a client um, and you first meet a client or introduce to a client and you get access to what they're looking at, do you find there's usually a gap in what they're looking at today versus what they should be looking at? And is there something that, you know, you think clients should be trying to be more proactive in, in getting? Yeah, I think... Is that too vague of a question? Sorry. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I, see, see if I'm answering it. Um, I think one of the challenges I see is that um, folks try to go from um, doing nothing to to driving a, a Formula One race car from an analytical standpoint. They, they, they don't want to give themselves permission to kind of grow gradually. So for instance, like have mastery over this one dashboard or this one set of information about um, visitors. Really figure out what you want to know about visitors, focus on bigger visitors, get good about visitors, then pick what the next item is and get good at that. I think they go in and they, you know, oftentimes the clients will say, how many reports do you need? And they'll say 25. Yeah. <laughs> so how many metrics do you have? 108. Yeah. And, and the reality is uh, um, they're not going to look at 108 metrics. And I get, if I gave them 108 metrics, 65 of them will be read every day. Are they going to address the red or issues with 65 metrics in a given yeah. day. They don't have time. Yeah. It's best to think about what are the two or three things I want to start out with, you know, build that, build that analytical muscle and have the tool correspond. I think one of the things I, um, Tableau is, I don't know that Tableau has done this intentionally, but clearly there's, there's some basic things you can do at Tableau and get value, right? Which is t- the, the magic of Tableau has been, that they do, they can automatically create a pivot table. You can switch the data and move data around, yeah. you know, without having to in Excel. You'd always have to recreate a new pivot table. They, behind the scenes, they're doing. Um, when Tableau first got announced, a friend of mine called it. You know, oh, this is just a fancy, uh, you know, pivot table widgetizer. Is what he called it. <laughs> widgetizer. <laughs> uh, so, so I think this idea that you could just start something you can do you can get value out of tableau with just basics but then there were these levels of sophistication you could add on yeah i think the mistake folks make analytics in general is they try to the level of sophistication that are questions goes from you know how many visitors that i have today getting good at that and figuring out how to consume that and what to do with it versus like now they're they're asking data science kind of questions yeah you know and then they have they don't have mastery over just you know, their weekly reporting. Yeah. 
It's just true because if you have too much information, they're going to feel overwhelmed and they're going to not use it, I think. And some something that happened to me by accident, I want to preface, like this was accident. I did not deliberately do this. But when I started a new job at a previous company, um, I was in charge of these reports that we could send out. And there's probably like 10, 10 reports I was sending out every week. Um, you know, there's other reports you send out every month. Um, and there were a few reports I just didn't send out. You know, for whatever reason, training doesn't matter. Um, won't get into that. But these reports did not get sent out and no one said anything. So the value of the report was shown right there where no one missed the report. No one was asking for it. No one was obviously using it. Um, we actually ended up getting rid of a few reports because of that. Uh, it quest made us question, like, how much information should we be sending out? Should, you know, and a lot of times it was, you know, it's just too much information. So how do we how do we focus that energy on on what's actually helpful? But but we see this today in sales law is that our, our, many of our users feel like if they need to be asked, they need to be more analytically sophisticated. They need to do more. They you know and mm. um, there's definitely a lot. They feel pressure themselves to. It's almost like peer pressure to some degree. Like hey, are you be, are you using data in your decisions? You know they don't want to say that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm data driven, right? Data driven company. Yeah. So there's versus, you know, like, Hey, we're really getting data driven on this part of our business first mm -hmm. and then kind of evolving, evolving and growing from there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is like all been ridiculously interesting and fascinating. And TJ, I've been in a very similar situation to that where I accidentally didn't send a report and turned out that nobody needed it. So do a, <laughs> do a data audit and make sure that the things you're doing are not just busy work. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. we're going to wrap up with the final question, which we like ending all of our shows with, which is if there's one takeaway, something that can be implemented today that will help people accelerate their online business. What is one thing that you'd like for our listeners to come away with? I think just to just to be patient and to be thoughtful about um, what they're doing. Um, I go back to the earlier point, like three metrics are, are better than 30. There's, a, there's a, always an argument to do more, but I would argue that, you know, simpler visualization, being thoughtful about things, being patient with, with others. I think that's the, you know, um, there's that famous quote, and I don't know who to attribute it to, but like, if I had had, if I had had more time, I'd send you a shorter letter. I think that we need, <laughs> I think that's very applicable when it comes to presenting data in the same mm -hmm. way. Less is more. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Michelle. TJ, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both. Thank you, Nina, for your time. Good to see you, TJ. Stay well. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Some amazing examples and insights there from Michelle Guillet and TJ Sizemore on how custom data visualization can help you and your stakeholders come to conclusions quicker than just looking at spreadsheets and analytics alone. Do make sure to join us in a couple of weeks when we'll be chatting with Tom Baker of Ford Baker on how to set up your Amazon shop and ads for success. Do be sure to subscribe to the show so you don't miss a beat and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts to tell us what you think. Stay safe and we'll catch you next time on Optily Radio.